I taught my bird to whistle like a referee. I can make a free throw when I'm down on one knee. I've been a fan of basketball since I was five. Now I am a fan of hoops speak live. Hilarious analysis, a mystifying trope. An angel with a cudgel breaking bubbles of soap. Like honey. Welcome to Hoop Speak Live. I am Beckley Mason. With me today, we have the full complement of Hoop Speak Live guys, Zach Harper, Ethan Sherwood Strauss in the house. Uh, we got the man, Jim Pete from Minnesota, going to come by yes. to uh, drop a lot of knowledge on topics ranging the NBA, but certainly going to dive into the misery of the Timberwolves and uh, also some historical stuff. Zach, Ethan, how are we doing today? Uh, let's try to keep it friendly. Let's try to not talk behind each other's back when someone gets kicked off because their internet connection goes down. Let's try to not be the Lakers. Look, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not an internet technician. Ethan's not an internet technician. Like, we, you know, that's just his opinion. Right, yeah. So we are, of course, referring to the, the ongoing media drama between... Dwight Howard and Kobe Bryant. If you have missed it, the subject is whether Dwight should be playing with his shoulder hurt. Here's some quotes just to catch everyone up. Uh, Kobe says, we don't have time for Howard's shoulder to heal. We need some urgency. Dwight's never been in a position where someone is driving him as hard as I am, as hard as this organization is. Um, it's win a championship or everything is a complete failure. That's just how we, the Lakers, do it. And that's foreign to him. So that's Kobe. Dwight says, uh, <laughs> this is my favorite part. Um, Dwight worries too much about what people think. And then goes on to talk about that, which is great because the one way to connect with someone who's worrying about what everyone thinks is to do an in-depth interview on your thoughts and kind of a meta discussion of where he stands in the media with ESPN. Yeah, I love I love the Lakers. This is one of the reasons why I love them. I feel as though their PR apparatus is very laissez-faire. Um, all news is good news, even if it's swirling controversy. Um, <laughs> in my experience with them, this is funny. It's almost like sci-fi. Some sort of older populace trying to just suction the life out of the young, out, out of the young to keep going and maintain their immortality. Um, I'm not sure what the uh, movie or book might be related to, but it feels very science fiction to me. I kind of just, uh, it's fun to have a little drama. It's fun to have, you know, I don't feel like it's like this hated, like vitriolic back and forth. It's just kind of like nitpicking. It's like that really awkward couple that's been together not that long, but they decided they already don't want to live with each other. And they're kind of just like, oh yeah, well you don't take the garbage out. Yeah, well you don't clean the dishes. Like it's just this very weird nitpicky relationship. And it's kind of fun to watch. Hmm. Make them sound like the characters on Girls on HBO. I, that was the first thing that, that came to mind right there. These these petty uh, these petty problems of the uh, Brooklyn hoity-toity former liberal arts scholars. It looks like Beckley has been kicked out. Zach, we're going to have to figure out a way to talk about the Lakers. There's just nothing to say about this team, and we're going to have to generate it. I, I, I suppose I, I will say this about the Lakers. I love the Lakers. I, the NBA regular season is meaningless. It's one big lie. It's one big stupid lie where we're trying to analyze everything for its predictive importance when none of it really matters. But the Lakers' regular season matters. Every game has meaning. Every game has intrigue. I, I don't want them to go away. I want them to make the playoffs. You know what You know what they man managed to do is everyone talks about how, like, the NFL regular season is more important because there are fewer games and that, like, the college football season is just, like, so impactful. Like, one game ruins it. The Lakers become college football. Like, everything is over the top. Everything matters. Everything is this like do or die moment. And when they die, they, everyone just keeps like making sure they're like, they keep checking the pulse and then they're pounding on the chest. They're trying to revive them so that they can bring more drama out of this. Cause as long as they're just in contention, uh, you know, that's when it's interesting. If they fall completely out of contention, 
I don't think anyone's really going to care anymore. The fact that they can still make the playoffs, that's the inter- interesting part. How do you feel about where they're at right now? Um, with the POW injury, obviously, uh, we're supposed to somehow predict this wildly unpredictable team, but is that the death knell? Is that it? Um, actually, I don't think so. If they can get Dwight back, I think it's okay because this is what I like. I like, I like Ron Artest at the four. I think he, you know, he's no longer a, a capable three. I like him playing a little four. I think he's strong enough to keep guys out of the post. Out of- Artest. He's like the new, like, stretch power four. Like, that, he's created a new position. He's the stretch power four. It's amazing. Amazing how? I want you to actually tease that one out. I want you to actually explain how that works, because I'm not sure I'm swayed by it. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain that he provides the rebounding um, <laughs> to necessarily be a four. No, I'm not saying that it works. I just like the the circus act of it all. I like throwing him out there because he is strong enough to to pretty much body any four. Like maybe Zach Randolph uh, could manhandle him a little bit, but pretty much everybody else. I mean, Ron's one of the stronger guys in the league, and he's he's just versatile enough to be on the perimeter. He can hit the corner three this year. I think he's leading the NBA in corner threes made, which is a, kind of astounding. Uh, so he can stretch the floor in certain ways. Not He's not Ryan Anderson by any means. He's not really Steve Novak, but he is like – He's this power stretch four. I love it. Ah, you're, you're weird, um, number one. Number two, the Lakers are playing the Celtics. Is In a game that Eric Freeman of Yahoo joked would uh, perhaps keep the attention of bored white guys after uh, – bored older white guys after football season. I don't think you're older yet, Zach. But uh, after football season has, uh, has finished, um, how do we feel about where the Celtics are and how do we feel about their overanalyzed success in the wake – of the Rajon Rondo ACL tear. I think that, uh, I think what veteran teams do is they try to band together. And I actually like what Doc Rivers said. He said that, you know, they, when, when Rondo wasn't in the game, they had this, this set in this system where there were no point guards. Like they didn't have someone pretend to be a point guard. They didn't have anybody. So they just kind of made it work. And that's, they just adopted that and extended that to the entire 48 minutes, which is good. They're not trying to replace Rondo. They're just adjusting, which is, Really, that's the biggest problem when a big injury happens is you look for a guy to replace what that star is doing, but they're a star for the reason. They're, they're that particular player for a reason. It's hard to, to replicate, so it allows them to kind of transition into a new mode, and maybe this new mode is something that works better for getting Jason Terry going, for getting Avery Bradley going, for getting Jeff Green going. Paul Pierce has to be aggressive in a different way now. Maybe it's better that they, they have to adjust their roles into a different style. I like when you said that they just have to make it work. It reminds me of, is it Tim Gunn or Tom Gunn? The guy in America's, uh, America's Next Top Model where his catchphrase is that you just have to make it work. It's really the, uh, <laughs> the fashionistas that you just have to tough it out or gut it out or whatever Kobe was, uh, was telling Dwight Howard. Tim Gunn. Yeah, okay, that's the name. Thanks, Steve. Like, you're just going to have to make it work. And that's essentially what the Lakers and Celtics are facing right now i'm not all that surprised there's this, a funny conversation swirling around rondo um whom i certainly love to overanalyze which is are they better off without him and i think that that question is too simplistic for uh, the answer which is complicated which is on many nights they're better off without him because regular season league pass rondo isn't great shakes let's face it he doesn't tend to be but in certain nationally televised situations and in high leverage situations in the playoffs um, he, as has been said around uh, the uh, blogosphere, provides of a higher ceiling. So there's no one simple answer to better off without. Beckley? <laughs> Thank you for the smooth transition, Ethan. Yeah, I think that um, one thing is that this is, whether or not it's better for the team long term, you know, is probably like having the most talented guy on the team is it's good to have him on the court against really good teams. But Rondo is, a, is for such being such a wizard and having like all these acrobatic passes and moves and fakes often is like a real pain in the butt to watch. And the Celtics to me have actually been a more enjoyable watching experience now that they move the ball up court quicker, more people share the ball, more people touch the ball. Um, as fun as Rondo could be in these glimpses, a lot of the game was him pounding the ball on top of the key uh, waiting for big men to shoot 20 footers. 
and you know it's been a little bit more dynamic i don't know if they're actually any better at all but uh they've been more fun to watch and you know for me as a fan that's worth something too all right let's bring in our guest this is a big big moment for us we're real excited about this we've been working on it for over a month and finally we have with us from uh you know from the minnesota broadcast jim peterson what's up guys his with the hair <laughs> oh wow <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining us today, Jim. Uh, I guess to start off, tough one for the Wolves again last night. Um, the expectations for this team were so high coming into the season, you know, not only in how well they could do in the West, but aesthetically what a beautiful style of basketball they could play. Um, what's been your analysis of kind of just the mood in the franchise right now with how everything is sort of falling apart? Well, it's it's not quite. I think Zach can attest to this. It's not uh, quite re regressed to the Kurt Rambis 15 win, 17 win debacles. But um, I just think it's it's more of. Uh, I think people see what Rick Adelman is a coach. They, I think they see the additions to the team, how they kind of remade the roster from one season to the next. Uh, bringing in Andre Kirilenko was huge. I mean, not getting Batum. And substituting Batum with Andre Kirilenko, I thought was a was a brilliant move. And you know, AK comes to Minnesota because of Rick Adelman and what Rick did in Sacramento and what he did in Houston. So I think the track record of Rick Adelman kind of gives a lot of the fan base uh, reason to be hopeful. But um, this season has been, you know, I've been involved in the NBA since 1984, and I've never seen anything like this at all. Um, the kind of luck where, uh, you know, Kevin Love breaks his hand at the beginning of the season, re-breaks it in Denver. Uh, big road win for Minnesota in that ball game where he got re-injured. Re uh, but it's been just a, a, a cataclysmic, uh, you know, chain of events. Uh, Chase Bunninger going down uh, early on in Chicago on really a non-play. Um, you know, uh, AK missing games, Peck missing games, Shved missing games. Uh, you know, for Luke Rittenauer to be the Iron Man, I think uh, tells you a little bit about this team. Jim, you've been around this team for a while, and you know you were there covering the team last year. There seems to be a much different attitude in the locker room from Kirilenko and Brandon Roy and, and even someone like Steensma as compared to the Anthony Randolph, Michael Beasley, Wes Johnson era. Can you just describe how, it, how you've seen it change? In the well, sometimes you wonder if the Phoenix Suns were watching you know, the games last year for them to acquire uh, Michael Beasley and give him money. <clears throat> um, but uh, no, I mean, you know, Bees is a great guy. You know, Bees actually just to talk with him and be around him is, is a great dude. Um, you know, Wes Johnson's a, a fantastic person. Um, you, know, I, you know, Zach, I was sharing with you that I, you know, did an analysis of, uh, you know, long athletic players that Minnesota's had over the years. And the list is pretty small. In fact, it's two, it's two uh, long athletic post players. It's Joe Smith and it's, it's Kevin Garnett. And that's pretty much it. They've had other long athletic guys, and Anthony Randolph is a really good example of um, Ryan Hollins is another one, you know, guys that have rolled in here that, you know, with expectations of them adding something that a long athletic post player would do uh, with mixed results. AR, you know, is incredibly talented. That's one of the reasons why we brought him in, but <clears throat> AR is AR. He is, um, he's a point guard in a, in a you know, power forwards body. Um, he really should play the five, but he, he plays the four, but he wants to play the three. Um, he overhandled the basketball. He just, you know, and so the, the pieces didn't fit. Rick Adelman, in order to play in the corner offense, in order to play in his elbow series, in order to play in his pick and roll game, um, you've got to be smart. He, he does not suffer fools very well. He's like, he's a, he's a calmer version of Greg Popovich um, in that, you know, he's, he's, he's very demanding in terms of what his expectations are of players. And, so I just think that they, they did a great job of remaking the roster. I think bringing in Buttinger was was incredibly important to the flow of the offense. His ability to I – mean, he's a lot like AK in a smaller uh, frame. In fact, um, you know, the way he cuts from the corners and works the baseline like AK does. Uh, he's a better three-point shooter, but he understands how to use flare screens on the backside of the corner offense. He understands how to – in this on the strong side, in split action, to sell the cut if, if the – the player jumps the cut, he's going to go back door and get dunks. Not having Chase Buttinger, I think, has been one of the really key things. But, um, you know, 
Beasley, AR, Wes Johnson, all the guys that were here on this roster last year had to go, and um, they haven't found much success where they've landed either. Yeah, Beasley is an, a particularly interesting case, I think, for a lot of people who watched him in college and saw not only the talent, but, you know, the toughness inside um, seemed to be the kind of player who would would have a home as kind of an inside out four in the NBA. What like what is, where does it break down for you? You said that he had trouble or he was either unwilling to or had trouble understanding what Adelman wanted out of him. But talent-wise, do you think that he was somehow overvalued coming out, or do you think that uh, something happened when he got to the NBA that has kind of made him into one of the hardest players to watch? Well, you know, I, I just talking with Ed Pinckney, um, who's an assistant coach uh, with the Chicago Bulls, when Ed was at Villanova, um, you know, he recruited all these guys to come in. So he he's been in. Uh, Michael Beasley's living room. He knows uh, he knows the family structure. He knows what goes on, and um, you know he you know we would just talk when Ed was here with the Timberwolves before he left um, and uh, went to Chicago. But uh, he, he would talk about how incredibly talented Michael Beasley was to watch him play in high school, and um, you know his upside when he was in high school, and then he went to K State. Um, he was amazing at K State. In fact, when he came out, I mean, for me there was some question. Chicago needed a low post presence at that time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Derrick Rose obviously was the number one pick, but there was some speculation. I mean, Beasley was, was so physically dominant at K-State. I thought his game was going to translate perfectly. Uh, he's so big. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen him in person. Michael Beasley is almost as big as me. I'm 6'10". Michael Beasley is he's absolutely 6'9". Uh, great physical body. Um, his, he's got a, a, a pretty good handle, a loose handle. Um, but it's it's the decisions he would make in pick and roll game. It's it's all the long twos that he would take, um, which the which is the worst shot in basketball. Um, and you know if he made them, it's one thing. Tony Parker takes a lot of long twos too. So does Steve Nash. But you know they make forty eight percent of them. So I mean if if Bees had that kind of conversion rate, you wouldn't um, you know worry about it. But his his points came in bunches, and um, a lot of times the bunches were early in the game or when it didn't matter. Um, and, and, you know, that just doesn't translate well into being a closer. He, he has all the attributes of being a closer. Um, you know, he's got perimeter jump shot game. He's got post-up game. He can both handle and set screens and pick and roll game. Um, I, I just, I just, it's disappointing to me that Michael Beasley hasn't figured it out. Um, but, you know, I just don't think mentally he has the makeup to be able to be an effective player in the league. Yeah. I'm Glad that I didn't have a blog back when that uh, draft happened because I definitely thought that Beasley was a better pick than Rose. And thank God that's not him writing somewhere. Um, I, I loved this roster in the preseason, and I had high expectations for it. And I believe that if they were healthy, they would have been a playoff lock. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think is the difference, if this roster is healthy, that would make them somewhere more in the contender strata? What would you inject into this? Well, you know, it's it just, you know, it's, it's been the thing that's been the bugaboo for this team is just to have competent wing play. Um, and we'll, the Wolves have not had competent wing play since Latrell Sprewell was here. I mean, it, it's been a long time since the Wolves have had someone from the edges that is able to um, attack in, in, in transition, to be able to um, get to the room, finish over bigs, to be able to get to the, to the free throw line at a high rate, um, to be able to shoot effectively down the stretch in games to when you have a two-point lead, make it a four-point game. When you're down by four to make it a two-point game, get closer. We just haven't had those kind of players. And, you know, I just think that um, the way this team was set up to play, when everybody was in their role, um, you know, we were kind of talking before this whole thing started earlier today, James Herbert and I were talking about uh, J.J. Beret, and he was asking me about J.J. If J.J.'s in his Dallas role where um, – Minnesota can spread the court with a four out and, you know, give him room to work and pick and roll game. And, um, you know, he's finding perimeter shooters and we've got Chase Buttinger out there. We've got AK. We've got, uh, I think Alexi Shved has been tremendous. If Brandon Roy, you know, I know it was a pipe dream to, to think that he was going to play, but the way this team is, you were mentioning was, you know, set up at the beginning was, was set up with the personnel in their role. Um, you know, Luke Rittenauer playing spot. Um, J.J. Brea playing spot play. Um, if, if Shved played fine, Chase Buttinger playing his role. Brandon Roy, Brandon Roy didn't have to be Brandon Roy in Portland. Brandon Roy just needed to be able to be 
I'm healthy enough to be able to stay on the floor, to hit slot threes and hit corner threes. That's it. And, um, and so given that, I agree with you. I think this team was set up to be a, a Midwestern conference, kind of where Golden State is, kind of record. And, uh, you know, Pekovic was tremendous. If Love just was 80% of what he was last year in terms of statistics, um, um, you got that stretch four ability. You know, I know Zach was talking about Ron Artest, but, you know, Kevin Love last year was unbelievable with Rubio on pick and roll game, how it's just so different when you have someone that can set a screen, space to the slot, and there's no way that the big hedging can get back to Kevin Love. Now they got to rotate from the corner, and it's it's swing swing, and it's either Kevin Love three or it's wide open three in the corner, and that's Chase Budding or Brandon Roy. I mean, you know, we are not competent, obviously, from outside the arc. Thirty percent, twenty nine percent from outside the arc, thirtieth in the NBA. If we just shot thirty four percent, having Kevin Love's free throw attempts, our free throw rates has plummeted. Um, you know, we're not getting teams into the bonuses often because Kevin Love's not there. So. You know, Kevin Love's free throw rate, Kevin Love's three-point shooting, um, all the things that uh, that we need, um, you know, just, just weren't there. So, uh, you know, we were set up, and, and injuries have absolutely, you know, derailed all of it. Jim, switching gears a little bit, uh, you had the pleasure of playing – I think you were the first guest that we've had. I'd have to check with Howard Beck, but I think you're the only guest we've had that, that played with Hakeem Olajuwon. Uh, did you know – <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you played alongside him. Was it I also he played was... alongside Leo, Lewis Lloyd too. So you know, don't forget Sweet Lou. Uh, was it obvious from the start that this guy was just going to be dominant for a decade or more? I, I've never seen any anything like it, Kim Elijah. Of course, you know, I played in the Big Ten, and I, you know, I played against some pretty good players uh, when I was in the Big Ten. Um, Kevin Willis was physically the only thing I'd seen that was anything remotely like Dream. When I got drafted by the Houston Rockets in 84, um, perhaps, you know, obviously one of the greatest drafts up until the LeBron draft of all time, um, you know, Jordan Barkley, Stockton, Akeem, um, Sam Perkins, just an amazing array of players that came in. I went down to Houston. Ralph Sampson had been Rookie of the Year. Rodney McRae was uh, from Louisville, and, and we started playing pickup games. And I'd never seen anything, a physical specimen like Akeem Olajuwon. He, he, they list him at seven foot. He's six ten. And his his knee joints and his ankle joints and his legs were so sinewy um, and athletic. And the way he jumped, I just I just have never seen anything like it. Um, he he would um, he had this thing that he did that I, I found out was one of his little go to moves was if you were boxing him out, he would use your shoulder to catapult himself even higher on tip dunks. So when you see those highlights of Dream getting tip dunks, a lot of times he's catapulting himself up the shoulder of the guy that's boxing him up, he's trying to jump and getting him even higher. Um, I remember trying to go up for a layup one time, or actually I was trying to dunk it, and Dream pinned it against the glass, and Rodney McRae told me, hey, hey Pete, you've got to take it to another level out here in this game. And, and he, he was absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I sat there with Dream uh, for four years and uh, worked one-on-one -on -one with him every day. Dream was an incredibly hard worker. And I learned everything he did. And, and um, I tried, you know, me doing it and Dream doing it's two different things. But, you know, playing against him every day allowed me to, to make it to the NBA and, and, and to stay for eight years. And um, you know, I'm eternally grateful for him. But uh, his athletic ability, his, 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 and Ralph Sampson was too, by the way. So Ralph Sampson, people don't give him enough credit. I'm so happy that he made it to the Hall of Fame. I just talked to him when we played Phoenix. He's on Phoenix's bench now. Um, incredibly proud of Ralph. All that he's been through. Uh, those two together were were incredible, and uh, I just feel really lucky to have that be part of my resume. Hey, I wanted to ask more a little bit more about Hakeem, who you know I think went underwent a pretty good um, sort of character transformation in the way that a lot of people saw him early in his career. He was uh, seen as such a you know a dominant, talented force, but maybe not the leader and sort of venerable old man that he's become in the NBA today. Uh, can, can you maybe discuss, you know, where where he was when he came into the league, and to what extent that's just a narrative that comes with winning, and that's or there's some real changes in maturation that happened for him? I think you can almost um, um, there's there's a lot of things that went into that um, for him. I think um, what he was he was Akim when he first came in, and then he embraced his his. his Islamic background, his Muslim faith became 
the, the first and foremost thing in his life. I mean, he bought a mosque. He turned a, a church down in downtown Houston into a mosque, and um, he started devoting himself to his faith. And I think that once once dreams started embracing that part of it, um, it really transformed him. I think that a lot of the things that happened in the late 80s, um, my my rookie year, Dream, we were, Dream and I were rookies together. Um, our first um, experience in the NBA was uh, to see John Lucas um, go down due to cocaine abuse. Um, he tested positive. John was cut our rookie year. Um, our second year, the year that we go to the finals and played the Celtics in 86, in March of that uh, in that year, you know, we're, we're rolling. We're playing great. Uh, we're on a collision course with the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals, and uh, we're feeling pretty good. And John has a relapse. And we lose John Lucas in March of, of, of 1986, and um, we lose John again. Um, and, and that impacted how, you know, we played against the Celtics. We could, I, I firmly believe that we could have beaten the Celtics in a seven-game series if we had John Lucas. We had um, Robert Reed. You see the games on NBA TV, right? You see these old games from the 86 Finals. Robert Reed and Alan Lovell, you know, handling the basketball, Roddy McCray to play point forward. Um, and then the, the year after that, um, Lewis Lloyd and Mitchell Wiggins go down with cocaine abuse. They, they both get banned from the NBA. And I think um, those chain of events of, of, of seeing how sort of living in a straighter path, you know, and, and that, that life is fleeting and that players can be out of the league quickly, I think it impacted Dream. And, uh, and I think, impl- you know, embracing that Muslim faith was a thing that transformed him. And, and he became a completely different player in terms of how people perceived him. You know, the wisdom, um, because he was incredibly smart, incredibly brilliant guy, great businessman, uh, really good with money. Um, really understood how to invest money, how to make money, um, really good with in terms of uh, how he took care of his body, incredibly healthy guy. Uh, but he, he was so frustrating to play with because he was one of those guys that was the absolute last one to get to the gym. I mean, literally, like rolling up, you know, 15 minutes before practice, getting taped quick, running on the floor, completely dominating the game. And then he was the first one to leave. I mean, he, he would not sit there and work on his game incessantly. He wasn't one of those uh, grinders in, in the gym. He did his work in the summertime, but in season, I mean, he could completely dominate the game with very minimal effort during the season. That's great. Um, I was I was wondering, you know, you've, you've been one of the telecasters, I guess, who's really embraced advanced statistics and kind of the quest for knowledge and quantification in the NBA. When you were playing, what do you, what do you, what's like one or two things that you wish you could have known definitively when you were playing or when you were coming up? I wish I'd had synergy. You know, I wish I would have had, I wish I would have had the ability to, um, to go in and break down my opponent um, the way that players can now. Um, sports code and synergy have completely changed the way the game is played. I mean, hey, I remember when I was in the NBA. During games, Rudy Tomjanovich was one of our assistant coaches. Rudy would be in the back in the locker room during the game with videotapes, like in two VCRs, and trying to hit buttons and try to record parts of the game with, and then try to show us things, you know, at halftime. And, you know, Bill Fitch was captain video back then. He was one of the first adopters of, of videotape as a, as, a, as a learning tool. Um, but, I mean, that's Rudy T will tell you stories about, you know, have, Bill Fitch is driving crazy with uh, the VCR tapes, you know, sticking in dual tapes, and it was just nuts, the technology. But um, I, I, wish I, I wish I had synergy. I wish I, you know, that statistically being able to break down what a team does, understanding their tendencies, being able to, um, you know, break down spots on the floor where, where players are more efficient versus less efficient, um, and maybe – you know, being in more of a hurry to get to the spot where they're hotter from and better from than um, maybe letting them take a shot from a spot on the floor they're not so efficient at, um, being able to determine whether or not a player like, I mean, obviously scouting reports are, can be subjective. Right. Um, a player can like to go right, but if they're not very good going right, maybe you want them to go right, even though, even though they want to go that direction. And so advanced stats tell you so much now about how a team plays. Um, I'm not altogether sure, even though all this stuff is available to players today, how much they actually use it. Um, but uh, I, I just know that I, I wish I would have been more of a student of the game from that standpoint. Statistically, there were some things available, but the, the wealth of information now is just, just amazing. 
Yeah, the the strength of video and being able to not just see the numbers, but watch you know the twenty pull ups going to his left and see exactly how long that first dribble is is really powerful. Yeah. Well, Jim, this is yeah, been- you know, um, just 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 being on the bus right now with uh, with the players, you know, as we're going to the game. Um, we don't see all the video work they do, and I, you know, obviously I talked to Jack Sickman and Sean Respert and and uh, Terry Porter and T.R. Dunn. They do, our coaching staff does a great job. They do a lot of individual work, but they're watching. Hey, I, Ricky Rubio it, it, with David Adelman um, in the on the bus on the way to the game is is watching video of himself and of the upcoming player he's going to be playing against on Sports Code. They're watching play sets. They're watching tendencies uh, on the bus on the way to the game. So Ricky is one of those guys at least for me that I've seen um, is consuming it. And um, it just, you know, it just adds so much. If you can just get one or two nuggets for a game, it could make the difference between whether you win or lose. So true. Thanks a lot, Jim. This has been awesome. Uh, We really appreciate you giving us your time and insight here. I, you know what, you guys do a great job. I, I, I consume hoop speak and uh, Zach and I are good friends and I really, really enjoy what you guys do. And uh, we'll see you down the road, man. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Peace. Thanks, Jim. See you tomorrow. It's going to be the greatest moment of Zach oh, Harper's life. <laughs> me and Zach are great <laughs> friends. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't even to say that. I haven't even given him the money yet. <laughs> wow. That was great. Man, we're going to have to do I've, this um, oh, as often as possible. Thanks a lot for hooking I that really, up. Uh, I may be a little biased here, but I do sincerely believe this, that I think he, I mean, Matt Gugus is right up there, but I think Jim Peterson is easily the best color analyst on TV for even national broadcasts. Like he really does an incredible job breaking down the game in both like a scouting department and an advanced stats way. Like he, he cites offensive efficiency, effective field goal percent. Like he really goes to the game and like does his homework. I don't think anybody works harder than him. Well, and then you combine. I'll put Jim Barnett's avuncular avuncularness against anybody, though. <laughs> His avuncularity. Yeah. Through the roof. I'll put Ethan's ability to make up words against anybody's. Uh, let's go to Dagger Smash Noted and close it out. Uh, who's got the dagger tonight or today? I do. Dagger. Right. As I'm always complaining, as I'm frequently complaining, um, it's like, you just can't be happy with things. The Oklahoma City Thunder are, are interesting to me. Their offense is for many reasons. It's an amazing offense. It's incredibly productive. They're one of the best three-point shooting offenses in terms of accuracy, and they get to the rim all the time. Um, also, uh, paradoxically, they have an incredible true shooting percentage um, as a team across the board. While the guy who takes the most shots in the offense has a poor true shooting percentage, uh, Russell Westbrook. So I, I like studying the offense, but I don't like watching it. I, I find the offense very difficult to watch, in part because of all the free throws they get and uh, their ability to get to the line. I, I would uh, make it analogous to a great song that often skips as you're listening to it or just has a few blips where it's just for us. It's just frustrating. So I, I, I stand in admiration of what they can pull off offensively, while at the same time, the flowlessness of it um, feels like a notional basketball to me and makes it difficult to uh, to enjoy. I do like the Ibaka threes, though, Kevin Smith. That is a, a, that is a nice quality to it. I also just hate Kevin Martin. I hate watching everything about Kevin Martin. Let's get out with it right now. Let's get all, this, all this crap, and then we finally get to it. I just hate Kevin Martin. <laughs> All right, Zach, you got the hate him. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. I've got two smashes. First smash, Jim Peterson called me his friend, so suck on that, everybody. Second smash, <laughs> uh, I do this um, this audit of the Timberwolves three point shooting every month now, and the, got the latest one going up today, um, where I break down how they shoot open threes, contested threes, and defended threes. Month of January, they shot. And this is not a lie. I went back and double checked the video. They shot 17.1% on open three-point attempts. 17% on open attempts. That is astounding. I don't. I don't understand it, and it makes me sad. I think you might be. I think you might be getting in their head with these posts. All right, my uh, my noted is um, on the Wizards' defense since 
John Wallace came has come back. Uh, J- Jake Whitaker of Bullets Forever took a look at it. Second in the NBA in that time, uh, 97 points per 100 possessions in this 15 games. Uh, which is great. Wall is obviously making an impact, but also uh, shout outs to Nene and uh, Emeka, who are a surprisingly effective duo on the back line and really do some uh, unheralded good stuff for them. So, you know, giving a little love that way. So thanks to everyone who heralded that. Thanks to James for setting it up. Uh, Bane for the beautiful guest image. And of course, our lovely guest himself, Jim Peterson and everyone who watched. Thanks and uh, have a fun weekend. I taught my bird to whistle like a referee. I can make a free throw when I'm down on one knee. I've been a fan of basketball since I was five. Now I am a fan of hoops. Analysis, a mystifying trope, an angel with a cudgel breaking bubbles of soap, like honeybees buzzing around a hive. Everybody buzzing about hoops speak live. <laughs>